Welcome everyone. Uh, we're going on a tour of Law Branch Road and this particular tour is special in that most of the individuals who are a part of this tour are members of Law Branch Church of the Brethren. We are starting our tour from Topeka Church so much of the information I'll be sharing at the early part of the tour will relate to what is a part of Topeka's role in the beginnings of Law Branch Church. Uh, as we are talking today about the history of Law Branch Church of the Brethren, we also are indebted to Topeka Church of the Brethren as the mother church. And I'll be making mention of the role of Topeka in the development of and serving truly as a mother to the congregation at Laurel Branch. Now, as we are on this tour, I'll be making mention of a number of different families. Uh, among those families are Hilton's, Harmons, Slushers, Goody Coons, Simmons, um, then we'll be getting to Termons and Bowmans and Reeds and Dodds and Sheelers and Helms as we're doing the entire circle. But we're starting with the role of the earliest settlers in this area. One of the earliest settlers was the English, perhaps Welsh. I think they probably more specifically were from Wales, which would be Elijah Hilton. And Elijah Hilton first settled down in this particular area. As we get to the bottom of the hill, look to your right. And his home was described as being near the stream. Now that may have been near the location of what is now the old Topeka Cemetery on the rise to um, a little bit further here to our right, but somewhere in this area was Elijah Hilton's first log cabin. As we are nearing this grove of trees, you'll be realizing that this is the location of the old Topeka Cemetery was also known as the Old Hilton Cemetery. And there are some suggestions that perhaps Elijah's home was closer to this knoll where you now see the cemetery. By the way, if you go in that cemetery in the center, you will find a mailbox which has this information about the stones that are uh, there, the information that we know about those individuals. There are other uh, rocks that do not have names on them, but once that, was, once that cemetery was filled, in 1899, there was the first burial in what is the current Topeka Cemetery. As we're going along here, this land was Elijah Hilton's land. He had come here by 1790, we know. And he had a number of slaves, we know that. In fact, we know the locations of at least four slave cabins back, and as we come back down, I'll point out to you the location of his home. One of his granddaughters, Eliza Hilton Sutphin, and her husband, James Abraham Lincoln Sutphin, lived in the house to your left, the White House that you see right down here. They called Narrowdale. And James Abraham Lincoln Sutphin, known by some, uh, but simply called him J-A-L, others Mr. Jim, was actually the individual who named this community Topeka. 
Now, he had become a store owner. He was also postmaster in the location that I'll be pointing out to you as the location for the very first church that was the Topeka Church. So James Abraham Lincoln knew a, an Indian word, Topeka, that meant smoky hills. And he thought that that was an appropriate name for the community. So even though the first Topeka Church was simply called the Brick Church, by the time they were replacing it with a wooden framed church, they chose to call it Topeka Church, since it was the, here within the Topeka community. Now as we come up Little Mountain, to your left, through the trees, there you'll see a gate and there is a path or plantation road that takes you into a field where a granddaughter of Elijah, Nancy Hilton, who married Christopher Harmon, and their graves are in a little cemetery just out of the, on the ridge through those trees. I'm going to share with you a brief story about Nancy. She was quite an extraordinary lady, in my opinion. She was described as being an imposing figure, which is to say for that time she was taller, perhaps somewhat larger than most women of the time, and most definitely an individual who was a determined lady. Her husband, Christopher, was away at the Civil War. At home, she had at least two, if not already by that time, three little girls, three daughters. She was running out of cornmeal. What's she going to do? She has one horse, that's it. And how is she going to take herself, sack of shelled corn, three little daughters, to go to mill? Now, since where her home would be, it's on Woodpecker Ridge, just over to your right. And so she's going to have to take her shelled corn to mill and what to do. Well, the story is that she tied her daughter's dress tails, as described, such that she could place them under the heavy legs of her kitchen table. Now, my thought is that she probably waited until they went to sleep and had tied the dress tails and had them under, they, I can imagine her placing them on quilts under the table, but such that if they woke up, it's tied in such a way they're not going to be able to run out of the, the little log cabin. So I can see her getting on her horse and coming as lickety split as she is able to do to go to mill. And I'll show you exactly where she, in my opinion, would have been going because it was her husband's uncle's mill, the Solomon Harmon, or by that time, the John Harmon mill. So, she, I think she probably had her shelled corn. When she gets to the Harmon Mill, they know exactly how much cornmeal that amount of shelled corn is going to make. And so I think they did the exchange. She got her cornmeal and headed back home as quickly as she could. Now, can we imagine today the kind of story mother leaves three children alone as she goes to, you know, that kind of thing. But, you know, what else was she to do that was their source of bread, the cornbread? And there is one other story I'll take a moment to share that when the raiders, it could have been Stoneman's men, we don't know for sure from the family story, but when she got warning that the raiders were coming, she put her little girls up in the sleeping loft and the food that they had, and then she had water boiling on the stove. When she heard them approaching, she herself climbed up the ladder to that sleeping loft with the boiling pot in her hand and dared them to come up that ladder or she would pour the boiling hot water on them. 
they left her alone. Now again, remember her as an imposing figure, a determined woman, a protective mother. They left her alone. I love that she was related to my ancestors and to many of yours as well. Okay, so this was Naradale down on your left, the home of uh, J.A.L. and Eliza Sutphin. And Eliza and J.A.L. had gotten this land from her grandfather, which would have been Elijah, or her father, Archelaus Hilton, by that time. Now, we'll talk more about J.A.L. Sutphin near the end of the tour, but let me just share for a moment that he also was a school teacher and school principal as well. So had many different hats to wear, so to speak. Okay, on your left is the location of the Elijah Hilton home. And if you'll look in your notebook, you will see the home of Elijah Hilton. Now this house was built by his great-grandson and it was built directly in front of the location of this house, the Elijah Hilton Homestead. And the information that is on your front page tells more about that particular home as well. Now Elijah Hilton, as I said, would have been speaking English. He was an Englishman. So this land up through this part here, Hilton, over on that side we've mentioned Harmon. So the Harmons would have been the Hermans. And we're getting uh, to soon talk about the Vettels, who would be the Weddells later. And of course they were German speaking. The Hermans and the Vettels were German speaking but they are the neighbors to the English speaking. In fact, Elijah Hilton's three of his grand, four of his grandchildren married four of the children of Christopher Schlosser, Christopher Schlosser, my ancestor, another German that we're going to be seeing located in this area, the Topeka slash Law Branch community. Okay, let me direct your attention now to your right, for we are coming to the location of the brick church. We don't have any pictures of the brick church, um, but we know that it was located in this area, this flat area over here to your right. In fact, that area at the time was described as being, and they maybe weren't aware of it or didn't think about the impact of the fact that that caused the brick church, the weight of those bricks, to sink into the ground enough that it was cracking and creating problems and they knew that it was better to simply tear the brick church down and build another one rather than thinking about trying to repair the brick church. But that's the location of the first church, the brick church. The brick church would have been built about 1857. Um, ten members had formed the congregation that became the nucleus for that congregation about 1845. The Brick Church built about 1847 and a grandson, Joseph Weddle, a grandson of Benjamin Weddle, whom we'll be talking about quite a bit from this point forward for the next mile or two. Joseph Weddle was the foreman of building the Brick Church. Hardin Hilton um, and uh, Joseph Weddle contributed uh, the remainder of approximately $500 after the congregation had come up with about $800 for the building of that first church. Now, the brick were actually made by the slaves of Archelaus Hilton, son 
of Elijah. Now, of course, the brethren belief does not support slavery. So, you know, there is that question, okay, how did they deal with that? Also, the land, we know that Archie Goodykunz's name and Archelis Hilton's name are mentioned as giving the land for the location of building the brick church. Archie Goodykunz, Gutkunz, another German, though he was not a part of the Brethren group, um, some sources mention him as a Methodist, I think that was possibly later, but at least here were individuals. My emphasis is we have Hilton speaking English. We have these Gutekunsch and Schlosser and Dettels, these individual and Hermans, these individuals who, though they speak different languages, and we know that Benjamin Weddell was continuing to speak German at that point in time. In fact, his oldest son, David, did not begin to speak English until after he was 16 years old. But they worked together. They were individuals who were working together to, to build whatever roads were necessary, to work together to provide a meeting house for the congregation that was the Law Branch Church. So when they rebuilt the church there, by that time it's about 1895, and we have another descendant of Benjamin Weddell who was involved in the construction of the what became the Topeka Church, the first to have that particular name. And that's what you will see on the actual second sheet or page that's in your notebook. And of course, here, 1951, for the building of this church, which has been added to and continually improved since that time. Now, Harvey Weddell was the foreman of building this church, and you see him in this picture at the dedication of the Topeka Church. He was a descendant uh, of Benjamin Weddell, Benjamin Andrew Levi Harvey, and Edmund Weddell was the foreman in this construction in 1951 of the Topeka Church. Benjamin Andrew Levi Elkana, Tom, and Edmund. And Edna Weddell here is nodding because her husband was brother to Edmund, who was the foreman on building the 1951 brick church. Do you have any questions? Okay, so now we're ready to head on out. Uh, okay, realizing Hilton land, but now we're really also on Weddell land by this time. The boundary between them don't know exactly where nowadays, but the Hilton land and the Weddell land definitely shared a boundary line. As I mentioned to you, and you can slow down right here at the center of the cemetery, here was the first burial in what we call the new one, right here on your left. Joshua Wade, where it says Wade Mitchell, all right, Amanda, who is Benjamin, Andrew, Joseph, Magdalene, Amanda, okay, well, that's how we're coming down as far as connection to Weddell. Her first husband was Joshua Wade, and when he died, she had him buried there she remarried Cornelius Mitchell. So we see Joshua on the left, and then Amanda, and then Cornelius on the right. So that's why it says Wade Mitchell. But 1899 for the first uh, burial in what is now known as the Topeka Cemetery. Still to some people calling it the new cemetery in, re in simply to contrast between 
it and the old Topeka Cemetery that we saw just a few minutes ago. Okay, we can head on out. And I'll tie in Amanda a little better as we head on this way. Okay, um, allow yourself to imagine that all of this was in woodland. Okay, we can look back there and see the wooded hills and it's not too hard, I think, for us to imagine all of this as wooded land. So what had brought Elijah to that location? What had brought um, Benjamin Weddle to the location where he built his home? Well, back in the late 1700s, we've got to remember that this was wilderness. Now, during the time of the Revolutionary War, this was the unexplored wilderness. Uh, a man who will not talk about too much on this particular tour, but a man by the name of Isaac Height was important to the role of opening up the wilderness. He had gotten this huge grant, hundreds of thousands of acres, and the stipulation, though, was that it could not be to Englishmen. Hmm, Germans in the Pennsylvania and Maryland and Northern Virginia area. And there were individuals who, through him, had come down here, uh, Guy Smith. Well, it would be the Guy Schmidt or Guy Smith, as he is later in the records, uh, seemed to have done much of the surveying of this area such that Jacob Gutekunz learned of this area. And we know that Jacob Gutekunz's father, George Gutekunz, shared a boundary line with Christopher Slusher and with Isaac Height. So it doesn't take too much to think, oh, okay, this would be how they would be learning about this wonderful area that has this wonderful stream and flat land along the stream. And you probably know that the people who are first to the area are going to choose to settle such that they can have the flat land for their cropland. Makes sense, doesn't it? In fact, if you've taken a course um, in uh, well, in, in talking about Appalachian studies, that was one of the emphasis uh, that I recall one of my teachers saying that you could pretty much tell which families came to an area first because they were the ones who had the land that was along the streams and the flat land. Then sort of the intermediary came next and those who came last lived in the houses that were perched up on the hillside. And if you think about it, that makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? So that, what brought Benjamin Weddle to this location? When you look in your notebook, the next pictures here are taken from a program of a Weddle reunion showing the appearance of the Benjamin Weddle cabin. Now, the cabin was located, and the next page behind it has two color pictures. And if you look down this driveway, to the left of the driveway, you see the tallest treetop. That is the location that these color pictures indicate. There's a big cottonwood tree there, right beside the foundation of the Benjamin Weddle cabin. Okay, so this is where Benjamin Weddell in 1790 came to Floyd County. Now, there is quite a bit of oral tradition related to the background of why and when he came here, but I will focus on why this location. I know that before coming into what became Floyd County, he was in the area of Big Lick, which is now Roanoke. And he is purported to have been the first settler 
to have come up Bent Mountain with a team of horses and wagons. Now he was a surveyor. You know, he served in the Revolutionary War. So, you know, how much time it took to cut down trees and determine the best way to, to make it up. But it was on the other side of the valley from 221. But he was the first to come up Bent Mountain. And there are some uh, people still in the community who have gone up the road. I'm not sure if it is passable now. But I know a couple of gentlemen who said, yes, I've taken my old Jeep and gone up, you know, so they are aware of what that trail would have been. I believe that he knew of this land. And most of the individuals who came to this area knew essentially the land where they wanted to come to, but where specifically to build their home. Okay. We know that the house, where you see the edge, the white edge of the house, just to the right of the car, that that home has within it the running water from the spring that served Benjamin Weddell's home. I believe that when he came into the area and he came along, what is now West Fork of Little River, which is down at the bottom of this hill, that he would have been looking for a strong branch that would have been coming from a good, strong spring and followed it up, found its head, which would be right to your right there, and that that was why he built his home here. To me that makes sense because we know that that spring fed his cabin. His son Andrew later built his home essentially same location by 1809 and then Andrew's son Joseph continued to live in his father Andrew's home and then Joseph who had come home from the Civil War and died of diphtheria, leaving his wife, Magdalene, to raise six little girls. Now, when we think of the fact that here is Joseph and he has, he has died, he is buried, in fact, in the Weddell Cemetery, which we'll see as we're coming back to Topeka along 221. But the, his wife was pregnant at the time he died, and she named that daughter Josephine. Now, Magdalene, um, I misspoke. Magdalene was not Joseph's wife. Magdalene was his oldest daughter. I'm sorry. Magdalene helped to raise her younger sisters. And she is the one who then married Daniel Spangler and they built the White House. Okay, now Daniel had previously gone to serve in the Civil War as a 16 year old, he and his brother. Descendants of that family have led her that he wrote afterwards to explain why he deserted. And it had as much to do with his religious beliefs. Uh, now that's Daniel Spangler down near the area of Spangler's Mill. That's the, the Spangler family there. But we know too that when he and Magdalene, Joseph's daughter, built this house, and continue to farm this land that they were very careful to make sure that if they had any workers who were um, maybe former slaves that they paid them and kept a an accurate record because they did not want any uh, discrepancy any thought that they had any support for slavery, certainly, even though that was even still after the Civil War. 
It is said that in that basement of that house that the uh, water which runs through the house now, and some of you may know of how troughs would be constructed where you could place your milk cans or your crockery. Uh, that was the refrigeration of their time. And that still serves that home. Even though they have updated it, they're still using the water from the Benjamin Weddell Spring, as we might call it. Also, the house large enough that when they had individuals who were helping to gather in the crops, there was a large table. Now, I'm imagining it about the size of the interior of this bus that could seat 40 around it and that they would be feeding all of the hands, the field hands, the neighbors who had come to help gather in the crops. Okay, so location of Benjamin Weddell, his son Andrew, his son Joseph, Joseph's daughter Magdalene who married um, Daniel Spangler and then they only had one daughter Amanda and though they had obviously wished to have more than one child she was their only child and their home became the location it is said for the visiting preachers who were coming because what I want to emphasize and why I'm talking so much about Benjamin and Andrew and Joseph, these were the individuals whose role in the formation of the Topeka congregation. The very first communion, foot washing, love feast was held at Benjamin Weddell's cabin. And it is said that the men had their foot washing out on the porch of the cabin. That they ate their uh, meal, the love feast, uh, on pewter plates and tin cups to drink the sacramental wine. And following in his footsteps, Andrew Weddell uh, continued to have people of this community come into his home after he had built a new home in 1809. And that was the site of having their meetings, church meetings we would call them now, but they were the meetings of like-minded believers. And so it's from that gathering of individuals by 1845, 10 of them determining that they were going to work toward building a meeting house that eventually by 1857 was dedicated as the Brick Church. Okay, all right, back to Amanda. Remember I pointed out to you her uh, grave marker. Amanda's parents, Magdalene and Daniel, since they had only the one child, had opened their homes that when individuals would come for meeting and they continued the, the role as had Benjamin and Andrew and, and Joseph, who was the individual who was the foreman of building the brick church. This was the place where the visiting preachers spent the night. Uh, they very often would be hosting a meal. Remember, individuals had to walk many miles. Some of them had wagons, some of them had horses, but there were many who were walking miles to come to either this home or eventually to the Brick Church for any um, gathering. And so their home became also the site of at least 25 children being cared for over a number of years. In fact, Amanda shared that there might be mornings when she would go out to find a child or maybe two children on the porch alone, their parents had brought them during the night because their parents simply couldn't care for them, didn't have the food, didn't have the means, knew that this was a caring, loving, able home that would provide for them. So sometimes the children might stay 
for a few weeks, but some stayed for years. And a part of the family narrative was that they always went to church meeting together on Sunday. So I mentioned that to you for another reason, because there is some mention of a man bringing a child to the poorhouse. And it was clear that he was coming in this direction. But there's not any record, any official record in, that I'm aware of to say that there was an officially supported poorhouse in this area. I believe that they were making reference to Magdalene and Daniel Spangler's home. This article that says Mrs. Spangler one of Floyd's oldest lady, age 87, still active. And she talks about having prepared meals for children going to school. And it's a very interesting article, but we won't take the time to, to, to read that right now. Um, before I go any further, let's do take just a moment to back up a couple of pages and talk about one more thing about Benjamin Weddle, because he is important to our story. Benjamin Weddle would take a six-horse team. Uh, some individuals may have had two oxen and four horses. <coughs> now, as far as any of the family traditions go, it was described as a six-horse team. This picture is from a book called Into the Wilderness and is described as being a rare photo of the kind of transportation that would be necessary for Benjamin Weddle to go from here to Richmond to get supplies. Why Richmond? That's where the train had brought in supplies and where he would be taking whatever goods he might have from this location, whether it was chestnuts, whether it was deer hides, whether it was possibly some furs from trapping, uh, whatever they might have had to trade and be trading those things for, well, I can imagine that his wife might need some needles, that they needed some, um, some uh, lead uh, to melt to make bullets for their muskets, that they needed iron to uh, make horseshoes. You know, they're, they're going to get those things that they cannot provide for themselves in this location. They would have probably bringing, be bringing back blocks of sugar, blocks of salt, um, those kinds of things. Now, it's possible that on later trips, it was to Lynchburg, because I think the train had gotten to Lynchburg by the time of his passing. On his last trip, he was 54 years old, just before leaving, he had made up his will. Now, he had usually gone alone. On this last trip, he took a grandson. That tells me that he knew his health was not good. As they were starting up Bent Mountain, this is on their way back with a loaded wagon of goods that are going to last his family and perhaps the neighbors. He probably was providing some of those things for as well. They were starting up Bent Mountain. He was at the reins, imagine him sitting on the wagon, when he died. The grandson, who was about 16, 15, 16 at the time, had him buried there and brought the wagon, the loaded wagon, home. Now, different of his descendants speaking of, speak of having a, 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 a pewter tray or a lantern, you know, knowing that those were things that were on the wagon on, the, on his very last trip. Um, so that after his death in 1807, uh, as I said, his son Andrew then uh, 
in the will, it is said that he was to get the home place as long as he was taking care of his mother, who was Anna Maria Eiler Weddell, and which he obviously did. Uh, and so he got the home place and by 1809 had built a new home there. Okay, so we'll move on. And I think, Mike, we're ready to move uh, opposite the story about Mrs. Spangler uh, as we head in this direction. I do want to make some mention of the Harters, the Harters. Um, Francis or Franz Harter, Francis Harter, um, had settled in this area, had a large family, but in his 50s, he, to use the phrasing, up and left. One of his sons had gone out to Ohio. Another son had gone and visited and liked the looks of it. And so the entire family, uprooted, sold to their holdings that were in this area and went to Dark County, Ohio. But one son who had married Margaret Stiegelman, Stiegelman, another German, um, and whose father was Philip Stiegelman, who was a teamster or wagon driver for George Washington during the Revolution. Um, when Adam Harder, the one of Francis Harder's son, who had married Margaret Stiegelman, came back to the area. So the picture that you see there is of his son, John Harder, and John Harder's family. And I'm going to put in a plug for the Old Church Gallery right now, because if you look at that picture, you will see that to John Harder's left, or to his right on the left of the picture, you see crutches. Those are homemade crutches because in the Battle of Chickamauga, he had lost the lower half of his right leg. So he isn't able to do the farming that he normally would have. And so when he came home, he began to do fine woodworking, built furniture, but also made baskets using rye grain that is twisted, put it through a cow's horn, where you've cut off the end, so that that is sizing the size of what we call the braiding. So if you turn the page, you can see some samples of his baskets at the bottom of the next page. All of those baskets and some others and his crutches are on display at the Old Church Gallery right now in our special baskets exhibit. And I encourage you to go there. You'll also see baskets made by Clovis Boyd and Charlie Hilton and a number of other individuals. So I definitely recommend that. Uh, also, just above that, I mentioned the name Levi Weddle when I said Benjamin, Andrew, Levi, okay? That is Levi Weddle, grandson of Benjamin Weddle. Who did he marry? He married Catherine Harder, daughter of Adam Harder, sister to John Harder, maker of the baskets. So again, tying in, that's telling you the, you know, the interconnections between the people of this area. Okay, again, this ridge, this road was not, would not have been here in Benjamin Weddle's time. Think about it. How do you build a road? If you don't have a road, you're going to go the line of least resistance, right? You're going to be, as you're thinking about Nancy Harmon coming on her horse, with her bag of shelled corn, she would have been coming down. Remember, we looked at the valley where Elijah Hilton's first log cabin was. She would have going down, been going down through that valley, basically following the stream, which was Spurlock Creek, and she would, which is on the other side of this hill. So think about it, that in that time, they're going to be pretty much following the flat land along the creek. Okay, now as we're coming down this hill, um, we're still Weddell territory. In fact, this is a Millcrest home of Glenna Slusher 
Weddle, descendant of Christopher Slusher, who married Wilbur Weddle, descendant of Benjamin Weddle, and Glenna, who is um, 91, uh, continuing to live here, uh, beloved uh, member of our community. Okay, focusing again over to your left, think of Nancy coming down through this area. You see the little stream down to your left, probably following a plantation road or path, at least a horse path at least, coming down through there. And she's coming to the Solomon Harmon, or by that time it would have been the John Harmon, Solomon's son, John's mill, which, and we're going to pause as I know Mike is already planning to do, uh, here at the bridge, because that mill was located just a little bit upstream uh, there on your right. In fact, the abutment or the um, location of the dam would have been pretty much where you see those rapids. You can sort of see that probably was the, what is called the mud log, which is the base for a dam for a mill race just above those little rapids. And so she would have been coming to the mill, exchanging her corn and turning around and getting back as quickly as possible. Okay, so you get a sense now, there were no bridges, remember, at this time. Uh, no bridges, so they would have been fording the creek, been fording West Fork. This by now is West Fork. You know, over on 221 where Reeds Creek and Old Furnace Creek join uh, to actually form West Fork of Little River at that point. Now, we're pausing here for another moment because as you turn in, well, before you turn, do look at the picture of the uh, seven individuals plus a framed picture on your next page. The framed picture is of Harvey Weddle the individual whom you saw at the dedication of the Topeka church, the wood frame church. These are his brothers and sister Elizabeth. Um, the individual that you see in the back left is Elkanah, grandfather of Edmund Weddle and of Tap Weddle, Edna's husband. And the individual who is uh, to just to the right uh, of the Harvey picture. No, excuse me. We're on front row. Go to front row. The one, two, three from the left is Samuel, who is an ancestor of Steve Harris, which I pointed out to a event and Steve just recently. And then beside him is Joel Weddle who is ancestor of my husband, DJ Keith, and in going back. Turn the page, and you see a couple of pictures of the Solomon Harmon Mill that would have lo been located just behind you to your left. Uh, a picture of, of either side of it, uh, and you see there one of those being the time during the winter, and some of you who may remember Frida Harder is the little girl who is standing at the front um, of her on the left side of the picture. You can't make it out here too well, but Frida Harder is in that picture. <laughs> some of you are remembering Miss Frida. At this location, when you look directly across the road to the uh, flat, grassed area, that was the location of this home, the black and white picture. This home was the home of Solomon and Elizabeth Slusher Harmon. Okay, so Solomon Harmon and Elizabeth Slusher had married in 1809. Solomon Harmon bought this land from Jacob Gutekunz. Okay, so now we're seeing the stream being a logical boundary line, okay? 
So we're pretty much ending the Weddell land coming down to West Fork as a boundary. And now we're looking at from here to the next bridge, in fact, across West Fork being Gutikunt's land back in the early 1800s. But he sold a section of approximately 50 acres to Solomon Harmon. Now, his wife, Elizabeth, was of marriage age, or at least near it, when <coughs> her father, Christopher Slusher, came down to Floyd County and settled, as we get past that next bridge across West Fork, we'll be into Slusher land. So really, we can pretty much mark the boundaries of land by when we cross West Fork. Okay, you'll see in this picture that um, this also, well, actually, I believe, and if you look on your right, this was their log kitchen. I believe that that's probably where Solomon and Elizabeth first lived when they first got married in 1809, that they would have lived there. And then as they had children and built the home, we know that they also had an outdoor oven uh, described by Ms. Laura Fligger, uh, who was a granddaughter of John Harmon. Um, when this particular home, and I think probably all of you, except maybe for Carol, remember, or Harry, remember the house that was here up until 1915. So the pictures below are of this house when the exterior weatherboarding had been removed and the side, it, they're called sheds, though, though I hesitate to call that to a home, but I think that's the correct description in the rooms that were added to the side in later years, when the owner, uh, Rhonda Davis Harris, who lives in the home across the road, determined that the house was just not fit for habitation anymore. But it really was more because of those later added rooms that were not holding up. And so she arranged for the house to be taken down. Well, now, I travel this road fairly often and was aware of what was occurring, so I would stop and check on the progress. And when I became aware of when the home was going to physically come down, meaning when the log portion of the structure was to be taken down, and that was by Mr. St. Pierre, and... He, I understand, uh, is using various of those logs repurposed, so they, I'm not sure how many other homes may be graced by some of these logs, but we do know that he had planned or expected, I'm sure, it to come found fairly soon because he had his big machine with the arm and so he, you know, here he starts. And he shakes, the house sits there, and he shakes, and the house sits there. And he, so it's taking quite some time, and he has to go and actually do some more weakening of a corner before he's starting with his machine again. Well, when the house is finally coming down, I look at my watch. Now, the day before, I was in my daughter's classroom. She was teaching fifth grade math, my daughter Jennifer Keith Davis, and she told her students on the day before this house came down that tomorrow, she said, there will be something that will occur twice tomorrow that won't happen again for a hundred years. Well, that got her students' attention. She was talking about, this is math class, the value of pi, the Greek letter pi. Fifth grade, simply listed as 3.14, okay? So let's see, what day was she talking? It was the 13th of March of 2015 that she was telling the kids that on the next day, something was going to happen that wouldn't happen again for another hundred years. 
So when I am watching this house starting to come down and I look at my watch, it is 3 March. It is the 14th day of March, 3.14. It is the year 2015. Now the next digits of the value of pi are 9, 2, 6, 5, 3. 3, 1, 4, 1, 5, 9, 2, 6, 5, 3. It was 9, 26. Almost. And I, every time, Mike, every time that I tell the story, I just get goosebumps thinking about it. But that's exactly the time that the house actually gave in and eased itself down.